Good morning. In the name of Jesus Christ, welcome to John McMillan Presbyterian Church. We are a community of people who are disciples of Jesus Christ, and it's our mission to provide a way for this community and the community surrounding us to know, glorify, and serve God. And it's our hope and our prayer that our gathering here today in worship and those of you gathered around your computer screens at home uh, will, bring, will be brought into the presence of the living God. Uh, Joseph, could you just bring me down a notch? Thank you. Excellent. So you may have noticed that, uh, you know, that I came in here and then I left again, and so I forgot to bring my stuff. Just so you know, I asked Joe Smith if he had ever done anything like that before, and he said he doesn't have to worry about that anymore because when you've been teaching for 40 years, everything's up here. <laughs> Everything isn't up here for me. So I'm glad you're all here this morning. There's some announcements that I want to share with you. First of all, perhaps the most important announcement I can share this morning is that John McMillan Presbyterian Church has a new director of Christian education. She is to my right. Her name is Emily Shabilla. Her office is next to mine. Uh, we will be publishing her office hours in the near future, but just make sure that you welcome her when you have a chance today to her new position on the staff. Also, uh, it's important for the folks who are watching at home that if you really want to sign in and let us know that you're out there, there is a, a click link right above my head, and if you click on that link, uh, it will let everyone know that you are here. Also, if you're in the sanctuary or in the narthex, you will see that there are QR codes posted on the wall. You can use those too uh, to take a picture of them, I suppose, is how it works, and that will let us know that you're here too. And we do that because we don't have sign-in sheets anymore, and we're particularly concerned about whether or not we have visitors here uh, who would like to let us know who they are and how to get in touch with them. We are beginning today a Lenten service sermon series uh, that's called Touched by the Spirit. Uh, the questions that we will be asking as we go through this series is, uh, what does the Holy Spirit do? How does the Holy Spirit impact the world? How does the Holy Spirit impact us as individuals? And how do we experience the presence of the Holy Spirit? And what if the Holy Spirit is spiritual but not religious? Questions that we will be asking throughout the course of Lent. Also, something new today is the prayer cards that the deacons have placed in the narthex. Uh, please pick one up. Uh, use that prayer card during the week uh, to hopefully remind you of some of the things you experienced here in worship on Sunday, and we'll get you through the week until the next Sunday. The Church Officer Nominating Committee is back in action. Uh, last week, one of the things we did was we amended our bylaws so that we will be electing new church officers uh, in May, and so we need to get our next crop in for elders and deacons, so uh, please consider the possibility that you are being called to be an elder or a deacon here at the church, uh, or if you're getting a call from uh, someone who's on the nominating committee, that that in fact is the call uh, for you to serve as a, an elder or deacon here at the church. This week we're praying for uh, Betsy Buonacani, Bob and Susie Berland, Craig and Lauren Berland, Marge Burns, Warren and Denise Carlson. We're also praying this week for two people who are suffering from cancer, our own Wayne Fast. Uh, we're praying for him and his family as he started his chemotherapy this past week. And we're also praying for Karen Lytell, a frequent visitor here at John McMillan Presbyterian Church and a good friend of mine and my wife uh, who is battling cancer as well. We will pray that they receive the comfort and guidance and curative measures that they need. And with all that said, let us worship the living God. Um, if you could please stand and join me in a call to worship. 
Come to the Lord with openness. Seeking God's presence, whatever it brings. Bring doubt, bring belief. Seek the Lord and live. Come, it is time to worship God. you see before you is something called a Lenten triad. The Lenten triad is designed to demonstrate the Holy Trinity that we worship in the Christian church, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It was created by someone who thought that it was important to have something like the uh, candles that we light at Christmas and during Advent to also celebrate the other high holy season, which is, of course, Lent. And so the thinking was is that we should have the candles lit to begin with. And so we lit them Ash Wednesday when we met here to celebrate that holiday. And now we begin the process of recognizing that during the course of Jesus' life from the time he was transfigured on the mountain until the time he arrived in Jerusalem, his light steadily diminished. And so we need to hear what this is all about. What well, starts with John 3.16 which says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, so that everyone who believes in Him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. Those who believe in Him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, 
because they have not believed in the name of the Holy Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and the people loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. And so each time we stray from the path that God has marked out for us, we diminish the light that He sent into the world, a little bit at a time. And so we need to come to the Lord weekly for confession. And so will he, you please join Emily in our prayer of confession. Gracious God, we come before you in need of forgiveness and grace. You call to us to trust you completely, but we do not. We are timid and fearful as we follow your lead. We justify our actions and words, though we know that they are not what you require. We struggle to understand the new life Christ offers, preferring old habits to risky change. Forgive us as we pray. Help us to be born again in the life of Christ, trusting you have included us by grace in the family of faith in Christ we pray. It is now time to silently confess. Friends, God is for us and not against us. For that very reason, God sent the Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Believe the good news in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven.
Will you pray with me, please? Lord, we gather here today as disciples of Jesus, and so we know that you are here among us. So we ask that you touch our hearts and our minds so that we can hear the word the way you would have it heard, so that we can understand the word the way you would have it understood, and so we can live the word the way you would have it lived. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So I think most of you know that I was a biology major at Allegheny College in the early 1970s. I was always sort of a science geek, and I actually co-authored an article that was published in a magazine called The Great Lakes Entomologist. (laughs) That article was about why freshwater dragonfly larvae eat what they eat and why we find them in only certain parts of freshwater streams. I'm sure no one here has read it. I'm not sure anybody read it, perhaps except me and my co-author. Anyway, because I'm sort of a science geek, I watch a lot of television shows and I listen to blogs and podcasts that talk about science. And there was one podcast that I listened to some years ago on the TED Radio Hour. It was fascinating. The podcast was called Solving for X. It was about the usefulness of mathematics. The thinking was that we can explain everything there is with math. Galileo was quoted, Mathematics is the alphabet with which God has written the universe. Woo. And of course, that caught my attention. And then I remembered after I listened to the podcast that I had read a book some time before called A Brief History of Time by the famous physicist Stephen Hawking. Here is the one-sentence summary of that book I found online. A brief history of time is Stephen Hawking's way of explaining the most complex concepts and ideas of physics, such as space, time, black holes, planets, stars, and gravity to the average Joe and Josephine. And so that even you and I can better understand how our planet was created, where it came from, where it's going. Now, the underlying theme of the book was that math can explain everything. Mathematicians and physicists do these equations and make these calculations to describe how everything works. This is the search for what's called the unified theory of everything. But the book depicts an annoying repeated practice that these mathematicians and physicists seem to use as they proceed to describe the universe with their calculations. Most of the time, the math works. But sometimes, well, it doesn't. It's very mysterious. So what happens when the math doesn't work? Well, that's where we get the great hubris of the math heads coming to the fore. Rather than simply say that math can't explain everything, that there are mysteries that can't be solved, these math folks simply make something up that makes the math work. Kind of like saying one plus one equals two, except when it doesn't. So, we will say that there is an alternative universe another dimension, and by the way, there are 11 of them now, according to the mathematicians, where one plus one doesn't equal two. It makes the math work when we do that. It gives us peace because we want the math to work. We don't like mysteries. We want certainty. But this desire for something that explains everything applies to more things than just mathematics. It applies to God, too. Trying to explain God is called theology. And theology is our attempt to explain how God works. But theology has the same problem math does. Math doesn't always explain how the universe works. 
And theology doesn't always explain how God works. Sometimes it's a mystery. And that's the way I read our text today. It comes from the gospel according to John, chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. Listen to and hear the word of the Lord. Now, there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of flesh is flesh. And what is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I have said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So as I do every Wednesday when we have our staff meetings, I have the staff read this week's scripture, and I ask them, what do you think? Well, this week, they didn't think much. For the first time I can remember, they were mystified. And as we talked, I realized that the meaning of this passage that we've all heard so many times is really pretty obscure. What exactly is Jesus saying to Nicodemus? What's this conversation always about? Well, as always, we need to put it into context. Forget the headings and chapter and verse numbers again. They're late additions and obscure the context. So here we go. Jesus has just gotten started in his ministry. He has apparently been performing miracles, though the Only one John reports to this point in time in John's gospel is that he changed water into wine at a wedding. And then John says this. When Jesus was in Jerusalem during the Passover festival, many believed in his name because they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, would not entrust himself to them. You see, people were following Jesus around because of the miracles, or as John calls them, the signs that he was performing. These things demonstrated that he was from God. The people didn't pay much attention to what Jesus had to say, they just wanted to see the magic. And so that's where we are when we come to our text today. So Nicodemus shows up. He has been following Jesus. He's a religious leader from the Pharisees, people who oppose Jesus. And so the first question we want to ask is, is why is Nicodemus following Jesus around? Well, the same reason everybody else is. The signs. The signs are proof to Nicodemus that Jesus, like the prophets of old, is from God. But Nicodemus is listening to Jesus, too, and he apparently has a question. We only see the question in Jesus' response. We searched for it on Wednesday. What was the question that Jesus was answering? But when we look at the response Jesus gives, we get an idea of what the question might be. It's certainly implied. It can come in many different forms. How about, how does one get into the kingdom of God? Or, what do I need to do? Or, what's the formula, Jesus? And these are fair questions, right? Particularly for those of us in the Presbyterian church. We like to think. We like to think. We like something called systematic theology. Systematic theology. There are hundreds of books on systematic theology. Christian Brady, though, is an Episcopal priest who describes systematic theology this way, and I love this quote. I have observed that so much of Western Christianity, and particularly the Reformation and its descendants, 
has been driven by a deep desire to bring all Scripture, belief, and teaching into a unified and consistent explanation. Traditions within The traditions within which I grew up and have since adopted are constantly trying to codify and organize Christianity, like Einstein seeking the unified theory of everything. That's what Nicodemus wanted, a unified theory of getting in to the kingdom of God, a unified theory that explains God, a need to understand a formula and a process fully and completely, and then to follow it to a T. I have an image of Jesus almost smirking. You want to get into the kingdom of God, Nicodemus? Well, you have to be born from above. Now, this is the proverbial born-again passage, and it needs a little bit of explanation. The Greek word John uses is anathen. It has a double meaning in Greek. It means born again, or it means born from above. If you have the NIV translation of the Bible, it says born again. If you have the NRSV version, which we have here at the church, it says born from above. Both are correct, but neither is adequate, which is why I prefer born, reborn from above. Anyway, Nicodemus, like many of us, doesn't get it. We know he doesn't get it because he has another question for Jesus. Wait, I got to get back in my mom's womb and get born again? Well, I can tell you that Marilyn Tyndall would have had none of that. (laughs) But Jesus ignores it and keeps going. In order to get into the kingdom of God, you have to be born of water and spirit. Water and spirit. And so maybe Jesus is telling Nicodemus that he is already halfway there. He has been born already through the amniotic water of his mother. That makes him born of the flesh, flesh from flesh. But Jesus said Nicodemus also has to be born from the Spirit. Nicodemus needs to be touched by the Spirit. My image of Nicodemus is standing there open-mouthed, vacant stare, arms out, looking at Jesus, kind of the way I looked when I took organic chemistry in college. Jesus tells him, don't be surprised, Nicodemus, there is no formula, there is no equation, there is no systematic process. This just happens. The Spirit blows by and points you in the right direction. As Jesus says, the wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Well, that surely clears it up, doesn't it? It didn't clear it up for the staff on Wednesday. It certainly didn't clear it up for Nicodemus. His next words to Jesus were these. How can these things be? My translation, are you kidding me? See, Nicodemus wants to be assured that he and his people are going to get into the kingdom of God. He needs to understand the formula and the process fully and completely. And then he needs to follow it to a T. But here's the problem, Jesus tells him. That doesn't exist. It's a mystery. Here's a modern example of how this plays out in our modern world. I find this very amusing. So I got a uh, Lenten devotional from Christianity Today this week. And so I was looking through it. And there's an essay written by uh, J. Todd Billings, who is a professor of Reformed theology. And in this essay, he tells the story about his being asked by some denomination that was developing a new hymnal. Uh, He was asked by the denominational hymnal committee to give his theological opinion on whether or not Charles Wesley's hymn, ready for this, Carolyn? And Can It Be? was biblically correct because the denomination didn't want anything that wasn't biblically correct in their hymnal. Now, I don't know 
which denomination it was, but I'm pretty sure it was the PCUSA. What was their problem? The problem was the refrain. The refrain is this, that thou, my God, should die for me. That thou, my God, should die for me. What was their concern? How can God die? If God can't die, then the hymn is unbiblical and can't be in the hymnal. If God can die, well, in Nicodemus' words, how can that be? So Billings, in answer to their concern, pointed out another part of the same hymn's lyrics. The lyrics go like this. "'Tis mystery all, the immortal dies. Who can explore God's strange design? "'Tis mystery all indeed." Billings goes on. In our day, when we hear the word mystery, some of us think of an ominous type of hiddenness. But Wesley's acclamation, "'Tis mystery all," could hardly be further from such a conception. This mystery is not darkness, but blinding light, a love so great and deep that it is unfathomable. It's a mystery. This is kind of what Jesus is talking about, I think. There is no formula, no unified theory that explains God. God can't be understood in that way. God is God, and God will do what God wants to do. Why? Because God is God. And one thing that God wants is for people to seek the kingdom of God. And to find it, according to Jesus, you have to be touched by the Spirit. And when you're touched by the Spirit, you are given direction. You're given direction a finger point to go that way, or that way, or that way. And so we want to know, is there any way we can make this happen? Well, Colin McCollum wrote a book called The Big Book of Christian Mysticism. The Big Book of Christian Mysticism. Buy it and read it. He says, no, you can't make this happen. He says this, God never just pops up in your life merely because you say a lot of prayers or meditate for half an hour a day. God is God, not a formula, not the sum of an equation that will always behave predictably. So the experience of seeking God is always open-ended, uncertain, and mysterious. The Spirit comes and goes where it pleases. The Spirit can't be predicted. How we get to the kingdom of God through this spiritual rebirth is a mystery. A mystery of love so great and deep that it is unfathomable. Now we can't know how the Spirit will touch us, when it will happen, what it will feel like, what it will do to us, what happens when it happens. But we know that it does. We know that it does. The Spirit touches each of us from time to time when we need to be touched, when we need some direction, when we need something to tell us this is not the way, that's the way. Go that way and you'll get to the kingdom. And when we go that way, there'll come a time when the Spirit touches us again and said, okay, you've gone far enough this way, now you're going to go this way. The Spirit touches us, points us in the direction God wants us to go. And so we need to pay attention And while all this is a mystery, and we all know we don't like mysteries, let me tell you how it ends. Spoiler alert. It comes eight sentences after our scripture reading today. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. That's what the Spirit does for us. Amen.
It is now time for us to share our tithes and our offering with our God. So please consider giving in any way that you can. Um, the, the ways are up here. And um, give what you can. In plenty or in want, all that we have is a gift from God. In faith and gratitude, we now return a portion of what we so abundantly received as grateful heirs of the promises of God. to you not only these gifts but also ourselves in grief deep gratitude for your call on our lives your guidance in this baptismal journey and for the blessing us that we may be a blessing to others except that we may bring for you our own good purposes in Christ's name we pray amen So we're going to do something a little different this week in communion. And this really comes out of a couple of things. It comes from uh, some worship information that Carolyn and I have reviewed, which we review from time to time from the PCUSA. But it also stems from a conversation we had at Bible study on this past Wednesday. Somehow, I forget how we got there, but we started talking about the great prayer of thanksgiving that we always uh, pray during the course of communion. And I, somebody in the group said, this prayer goes on and on and on, and all it does is say things we already know, Jeff. I don't understand why we do that. Well, that's a really good question. And the simple reason is this. It's not so much a prayer asking for God to do something for us. It's thanking God for doing something already for us. And it's a prayer that summarizes the good news of the gospel completely in a very sometimes long prayer. And so we decided, Carolyn and I, that if this prayer to God for thanksgiving is so tedious for you, perhaps you would like to join us in the prayer. And so that's what we're going to ask you to do. When we get to the great prayer of thanksgiving, you are going to get to join us in song. The words to a hymn are going to appear on the screens, and when they appear, Elizabeth is going to give you a note. And when you hear that note, it's time to start singing. And that way you can participate in this great prayer of thanksgiving. Also, one of the other things is that I will be offering some meditative words during the distribution of the elements. 
uh, this week from the Psalms. And so with all that said, the table of the bread and the cup is now ready. It is the table of company with Jesus and all who love him. It is the table of sharing with the poor of the world with whom Christ identified himself. It is the table of communion with the earth into which Christ became incarnate. So come to this table, you who have been here often and you who have not been here for a long time. Come to this table, you who have uh, had lots of faith and you who would like to have more faith. Come to this table, you who have tried to be a follower of Jesus and like the rest of us have so often failed. Come. It's not me who invites you here. It is Jesus Christ himself who invites you to join him at this table. So will you please join me in the great prayer of thanksgiving as is printed in the bulletin. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with choirs of angels and with all the faithful of every time and place who forever sing to the glory of your name. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. things in the name of Jesus Christ who taught us this prayer saying our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors 
And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. On the night of his arrest, our Lord Jesus gathered with his disciples for one final Passover meal. And he took the bread, and he gave thanks to God for it, and then he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat. This is my body given for you. Whenever you eat this bread, do it, remembering me. because he has heard my voice and my supplications. Because he inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord O oh Lord, pray, save my life. Gracious is the Lord and righteous, our God is merciful. The Lord protects the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return, O oh my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you, for you have delivered my soul from death my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I kept my faith even when I said I am greatly afflicted. I said in my consternation, everyone is a liar. What shall I return to the Lord for all this bounty to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious, in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful ones. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the child of your serving maid. I have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you a thanksgiving sacrifice and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst of Jerusalem, praise the Lord. body of Christ. In the same way, he took the cup and he poured it out and gave it to his disciples, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant 
sealed with my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink from this cup, do it remembering me. Hear the words of the psalmist. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his steadfast love endures forever. Out of my distress, I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me in a broad place. With the Lord on my side, I do not fear. What can mortals do to me? The Lord is on my side to help me. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to put confidence in mortals. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. All nations surround me. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surround me, surrounded me on every side. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me like bees. They blazed like fire of thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. I was pushed hard so that I was falling, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my might. He has become my salvation. There are glad songs of victory in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has punished me severely, but he did not give me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I might enter through them and give thanks to God. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. It is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. cup of salvation. We continue with the liturgy. Will you join me in prayer? Gracious God, truly you have met us here and have tasted your love and glimpsed your image reflected in our neighbors. Continue to burn in our hearts, we pray, until we recognize your coming. Wherever bread and hearts are broken, 
For we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, whose every breath was praise. Everybody likes certainty. Everybody likes predictability. Unfortunately, God doesn't give us that. God gives us the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives, and it blows where it blows. It comes where it comes and goes where it goes. All we need to do is let it touch our hearts and move in the direction it sends us. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Go in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Help us know you.